All right, guys, they're in Luke chapter 15. I'm glad we've got a chapter that's a little um, not so meaty, you know, um, because I do want to cover some things before we get too much into this chapter. But first look at verse number 7, Luke 15, verse 7. It says, I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth. The title of the sermon tonight is One Sinner That Repenteth, all right? So this chapter is not that meaty compared to many of the other chapters that we have in Luke. I could preach through this pretty quickly, but I want to use the time that I have to really explain to you a little bit more about parables, okay? We know when Jesus Christ came, you know, teaching his disciples, he used many parables, okay? And you've got to be careful about parables, all right? The other thing you need to understand is when Jesus Christ came, For those three years in his ministry, he was preaching every single day. And many of those times for the whole day. Okay? And also, because he was traveling, he was going from town to town, city to city, many times he taught the same thing over and over again. Okay? So, what's good about the Gospels is it it captures a, a snapshot of what Jesus preached. And sometimes there are parallel teachings, but they're not parallel as far as, um, Uh, What's the word I'm looking for as far as chronology? Because sometimes Jesus preached, yeah, the same thing, but to different people. And sometimes even the application was different compared to uh, who is he talking to. And you've got to look at the context of everything you see. I mean, just to give you an example, and, and, you know, sorry, I'll say this because a lot of people misunderstand Luke 15 to be about salvation. Okay? And I've already shown you as we've gone through the book of Luke many times, we've looked at certain teachings where people try to add a workspace gospel, okay? Now, the biggest misconception you can have is is assuming that Jesus was preaching on salvation all the time. You know, that he was preaching on the gospel every time. You think for the three years, every day of preaching, he was always teaching on on salvation? No, he taught on, on many things, on many things. And in chapter 15 of Luke, he's actually teaching not about salvation, but about a backslidden Christian, Okay, now we'll go into that later on, okay? But about a backsliding Christian. Jesus taught many things. He taught about, you know, um, you know treasures in heaven, you know, uh, working for the treasures in heaven. He taught, um, you know, how to, how to be a good neighbor. And he taught many things besides just salvation. And when you think about my ministry here, okay, I've not been teaching for three years. I've only been teaching for 15 months. And in those 15 months, I only teach for like twice a week. Does it, you know, and when you look at my teaching, have I always been teaching about the gospel? You know, is, is every sermon I've ever preached about the gospel all the time? Of course not, okay? We've covered many, many topics, you know, during these 15 months. Many times, yeah, about the gospel. Many times we do touch upon it, but most often than not, we're teaching on other aspects, okay? Just on Christian living or um, just, just a solidified, you know, doctrine, things like that. So we can't assume every time Jesus preaches, it's about salvation, now, one clear way to know if he's teaching about salvation, if he talks about salvation of the soul, if he talks about eternal life, if he talks about hell, when he talks about these topics, then you can assume, you can look at the passage and say, well, this must be about salvation. Okay? So I, I say that because you need to be careful with parables. You know, parables are there to serve an, as an illustration. Okay? It's there to serve as an illustration to help solidify to help visualize doctrine that we're already familiar with, okay? I'm saying that because you should not build your doctrine primarily on parables, okay? It's a dangerous thing. I mean, pretty much every pastor will, be, will warn you about that, okay? Uh, don't build your doctrines primarily on a parable. Let the parable help develop, help visualize doctrines that are already clearly stated in the Bible, Okay? I mean, one example of that was when we went through Luke 13. And we looked at the parable of the, of the mustard seed and the parable of, of leaven, you know, representing the kingdom of God. You know, if I only use those two parables to start with, you know, I, I can make that mean anything. But, you know, it, it was all the other teaching on the kingdom of God, trying to wrap my head around it, accepting everything else that I saw is true. And then it was the parable that helped me visualize and put it in a nice order. Okay. So that's important. Parables are there to help us illustrate things, but parables are are, are set in a way to be purposely a little bit cryptic, purposely by Jesus Christ, okay? 
Like, for example, in, and you don't need to turn there, but in Matthew 13, verse 10, it says, And the disciples came and said unto him, said unto Jesus, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? He answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. So Jesus uses parables, yes, to give us light as believers, to help illustrate something, but also it's a bit cryptic, so there are, there are certain people that God does not want to reveal those truths to. Okay? Certain people like, like reprobates, people that hate God, that hate the teaching of God, they're never going to come to the knowledge of truth. Okay? So parables are, are set in a way to be purposely cryptic, cryptic. Okay? We need to be careful about that. All right? The other thing you need to understand is that parables can have multiple applications. All right? Now, <coughs> ah, sorry. Uh, a good example of this is the parable of the Good Samaritan. Okay? The, the primary application of the parable of the Good Samaritan was about being a good neighbor. You know, how can we be a good neighbor? And we saw the Samaritan helping a Jewish person. Okay, because in the time of Jesus, the Samaritans hated the Jews and the Jews hated the Samaritans. So Jesus was given a good example of what it's like to be neighborly. But we can also take a secondary application to that parable and teach how Jesus Christ came and came and healed us. You know, that he restored us and that he paid all things so we would be made whole. We can take that secondary application. But the key thing I want you to understand is whatever applications you draw from a parable, it must be aligned with all other doctrines that are in the Bible. Okay? It can't contradict clear doctrines. You can't be like, well, hold on, this parable seems to be saying something else. I need to change my, my other doctrines. No, you, you can't build your doctrines on parables. Okay? That's not the reason behind it. And, um, you know, let, let me give you an example of this because... Let me just make sure I've got this right. Actually, turn to Matthew. Turn to the book of Matthew. Keep your finger there in, in Luke 15. Turn to Matthew 18, verse 7. Matthew 18, verse 7. Because, as I said, some parables, some teachings can have multiple applications. When we looked at Luke 13, remember that teaching of Jesus Christ when he said, when he spoke about, you know, um, you know about saying, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. And we saw that it was an application to believers that received him as he came into Jerusalem, but it was also applicable to those that were uh, eternally damned. They would not escape the damnation of hell, and they too will proclaim that truth at some point in their lives. Okay, So we need to be careful about that. Sometimes the teaching is to believers, but there's also an application to non-believers. All right. Now I want to give you this example, because let's go to Matthew 18, verse 7. Let's have a look at this together. Woe unto the world because of offenses. For it must needs that offenses come, but woe to that man by whom the offense cometh. Wherefore, if thy hand or thy foot offend thee, cut them off and cast them from thee. It is better for thee to enter into life halt or maimed rather than having two hands or two feet to be cast into everlasting fire. Now let's stop there for a moment. What's everlasting fire? Hell, right? Uh, the lake of fire or hell. So... As we start looking at this, the context of what we're reading, you will understand that this is about salvation, the salvation of the soul. Let's keep going. There's number nine. And if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. It is better for thee to enter into life with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into hellfire. Take heed that ye despise not one of these little ones, for I say unto you that in heaven their angels do always behold the face of my Father which is in heaven." For the Son of Man is come to save that which was lost. Now, do you think that's a, a sentence about salvation? I do. Especially when he's come off talking about hellfire. Okay, let's keep going. How think ye, if a man have a hundred sheep, and one of them be gone astray, doth he not leave the ninety and nine and go off into the mountains, and seek if that which is gone astray? And if so be that he find it, verily I say unto you, he rejoiceth more of that one sheep than of the ninety and nine which went not astray. Now look at this. Even so, it is not the will of your, your Father which is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. Now do you think it's safe to say that parable there of the lost sheep is about salvation? I, I think it's perfectly reasonable. Within the context of what we're seeing. Jesus warning of hellfire, you know, saying that he's come to save 
uh, that which was lost, okay, and talking about, you know, you know, about the little ones not perishing, okay. I believe it's, it's safe to assume there in Matthew that the parable of the lost sheep is about salvation, all right. Now, what happens is some preachers will go, well, yeah, that's about salvation. So when they read about it in Luke 15, or six, uh, yeah, 15, is that what we're up to? 15, yeah, 15. They'll then say, well, this must be about salvation as well. Mistake immediately, okay? Because all it is is to help visualize some truth, okay? And as I said, sometimes Jesus uses that teaching or parables, but has different applications based on the context of what you're reading, okay? Keep that in mind. Be careful when you preach with parables, okay? Make sure your parables are supportive of existing clear, sound doctrine and not creating some brand new doctrine that might be heretical, all right? So be mindful of that. Now, let's cover some very clear doctrines, okay? You don't need to turn there. Uh, you're already familiar with this passage. Well, you're in Matthew. You can turn there if you want. Matthew 7, verse 22. Matthew 7, verse 22. Uh, let, let's just solidify some things before we get into the parables. Let me ask you this question. Um, do non-believers, do they belong to God? Non-believers, are they known of God? Non-believers? I mean, look, God knows everyone, of course. God knows who are saved and knows who are not saved. Okay, and God obviously knows who will eventually be saved and who will receive him as Savior. But the Bible is very clear when he does not know somebody in the spiritual sense, it means that they are not saved. And that if you are known of God, you are someone that is saved. Okay? So, of course, this familiar passage to all of us, Matthew 7, verse 22. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. What does Jesus say about those that are unsaved in the day of judgment? He says, I never knew you, okay? Spiritually speaking, in terms of salvation, he says, I never knew you. I don't know who you are, okay? You say you've done all these amazing works in my name. I don't even know who you are, okay? That's the reality of the unsaved person who passes away without Christ. Now, go back to Luke, Luke chapter 13. Luke chapter 13, verse 25. Luke 13 Verse 25, we covered this not long ago. Uh, once, uh, when once the master of the house is risen up and have shut to the door, and ye begin to stand without and to knock at the door, saying, Lord, Lord, open unto us. And he shall answer and say unto you, I know you not whence ye are. Then shall ye begin to say, We have eaten and drunk in thy presence, and thou hast taught in our streets. But he shall say, I tell you, I know you not whence ye are. Depart from me, all ye workers of iniquity. So here we have God not just saying, I don't know who you are, but he says, I don't even know where you're from. I don't know anything about you. That's the reality of the non-believer as they face God on judgment day. He doesn't know them. Okay? Now, if you guys can turn to Galatians chapter 4. Galatians chapter 4 verse 6. Galatians chapter 4, verse 6. And because ye are sons, so these are saved people, right? Because ye are sons, God has uh, sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. See, because we're sons of God, we can cry unto God and call Him our Father. Okay? If you're not saved, God is not your Father. You can only have him as your father if you have the spirit of his son, the spirit of Jesus Christ. Verse number seven. Wherefore thou art no more a servant. That's important as we go through these parables later on. Wherefore thou art no more a servant, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Howbeit then when ye knew not God, ye did service unto them which by nature are no gods. But now after that ye have known God, or rather unknown of God, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements whereunto ye desire again to be in bondage. So you can see that when you become a son of God, 
Okay, we're heirs uh, 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 through Christ, and we are known of God. You know, when we, say, when we, when we see God, He's not going to say to you, I never knew you. He's not going to say to you, I don't know where you're from. God's going to say, I know you. Okay, and He's going to open His books, and your name's going to be there written in the book of life. He knows who you are. Okay? Now, that's clear. Okay? Th- those passages are clear. That may, you know, put them all together, it's crystal clear. You know, unsaved, God does not know you. Saved, God knows you. Okay? That's important because when we get to these parables, we can't change what's clear in the Bible. Okay? So what's clear? That salvation is without works. We know that. That when you become a son of God, that you are known of Him. It's clear that the unsaved are unknown by God. Of course, we know eternal security. Once you're saved, you're always saved because these parables... Uh, not so much in the Baptist churches, but these parables are used by other churches to teach, see, you can lose your salvation, so you've got to come back to God and, and get your salvation back or whatever. No, we, we know that eternal security is a clear doctrine. It's, it's called eternal life for a reason, all right? And uh, so then allow the parables that you read to help structure, to help visualize that what you, what you already know, okay? Please be careful. Please be mindful about that when you teach on parables, Otherwise, you can get into a lot of trouble. Anyway, Luke 15, verse 1. Let's get to Luke 15 now. I hope that's given you a good introduction. Luke 15, verse 1. Then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes murmured. You know, they're, they're whispering, criticizing. You know, this man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. The, the Pharisees did not, not that, learn their lesson from the previous chapter. Jesus Christ, remember what the previous chapter was talking about, you know, about humbling yourselves and God will exalt you. You know, here we have the Pharisees. They haven't learned their lessons. They're still exalting themselves above all these sinners and publicans and saying, how how can that Jesus, how can that so-called man of God be dealing with sinners and publicans? You know, those that cheat their fellow man. You know, in other words, they're uplifting themselves. Okay, they're exalting themselves once again. Verse number three. And he spake this parable unto them, saying... Here we have the parables. We're going to enter now in this chapter three parables, and each of these three parables are teaching the same truth. But notice the first parable is the same one, the same illustration that we read in the book of Matthew, which was about salvation. What, I, what I'm saying to you, what I'm putting forward to you, is that now it's not about salvation, but it's about a, uh, a backslidden Christian. Okay, let's look at it. Verse number four. What man of you... Having an hundred sheep, if you lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness, and go after that which is lost until he find it. And when he hath found it, he layeth up on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he cometh home, he calleth, calleth together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth, more than over 99 just persons which need no repentance. Now you may notice in Matthew, Jesus did not mention that bit about the repentance. Okay? I don't know if you guys recall that. But now when he gives this story, this illustration, now he talks about the repentance. Okay? Now he talks about rejoicing over one sinner that repenteth. Okay? So all these parables, they're teaching the same truth. And we start... It's very numerical. We start with one lost sheep out of a hundred. Okay? So it's one lost sheep out of a hundred. All right? If you had a, now I don't know about you. If I had 90, if I had a hundred sheep and I still had 99 and one went missing, I don't know if I would go and look, look for that sheep. I'm just saying, just myself, if I was just, a, 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 you know, with animals, I'd probably go, well, I've got 99 of them, you know. But it shows us the heart of God. Okay? It shows us that God is concerned even for one in a hundred. Okay? That He's concerned over one sinner that leaves that, that group, that leaves that flock of sheep, and is eager to go and search them out to find them and to bring them back. And what I'm putting forward to you guys today is that this is about the backslidden Christian. What I'm saying to you right now is this sheep already belonged to the shepherd. This sheep was already known by the shepherd. Okay? The shepherd could not say, I never knew you. Okay? But it does belong to the shepherd. He goes and seeks it. 
and brings it back. All right? Let's keep reading because this will come clearer as we move on. Verse number 8. The next parable. Either, what woman having ten pieces of silver, if she lose one piece, doth not light a candle and sweep the house and seek diligently till she find it? And when she hath found it, she calleth her friends and her neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I had lost. Likewise, I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. So we have a very similar story. A woman starts with ten pieces of silver. Okay, ten pieces of silver and she loses one. Instead of it being one of a hundred, now it's one of ten. Okay, one of ten. And even then, you know, she, she still has nine, but she goes and seeks diligently for that one that was missing. Okay, if you're one in ten, that makes you more valuable than one in a hundred. Right? Makes you more valuable. And as we see, as we move on in these parables, you start to see how valuable a sinner is to God that has left his fold. How valuable it is to God when one of his children leaves him, departs into the world and destroys his life and goes after wickedness and sin, who backslides. They're still valuable to God. All right, They're not any less valuable. And he wants them back. He wants them to return. And if they return, the Bible says that there's going to be rejoicing, okay? That God will rejoice, but the angels in heaven will be rejoicing as well. An amazing truth, an amazing thing, you know, especially if you are someone that's backslidden, you know? You can be at church and still be backslidden, you know? Your heart might be far from God. You might just be keeping up the appearances, coming to church, you know? But there are others that, you know, go all out, you know? that They destroy their lives on this earth. You know, they seek after the pleasures of this world. They get sick of church. They get sick of serving God. And yet, if they repent and come back to Him, God rejoices. The heavens rejoice to see the children of God come back. But I just want to point out there, again, the woman with the silver, it belonged to her to begin with. She knew of the silver to begin with. She lost it. She brought it back. Again, she can't say, I never knew you, or I never knew that piece of silver. Okay, that's why she went searching for it. All right. Look, let's look at verse number 11 now. Verse number 11. The, the third and final parable here. It says, And he said, A certain man had two sons. So now, from one to a hundred, to one in ten, now it's one in two. Okay, how important. You know, we see the value increase of this lost uh, sinner. Okay? Now, again, it's a man that had two sons. Are we all sons of God? Is everybody that's born in this world a son of God? Are the people that go to hell for all eternity, are they sons of God? No. Okay. But there's that misconception in churches that we're all children of God. There is that misconception, you know. I'm pretty sure I've heard it preached myself, you know, be, you know sitting in the pew or whatever. But the Bible says very clearly, and I love, I love John 1.12, you know, but as many as received him, to them gave you power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Okay? We become children of God, we become sons of God when we believe on Jesus Christ. All right? So if this man had two sons, do you think this represents an unsaved person? No, it's going to represent saved people. Otherwise, they cannot be rightly called a son. That's what we read in Galatians chapter 4, remember? We'll look at that again a bit later. Uh, but um, <clears throat> I'll just quickly say this. Before I read that, every person in this world is a son of Adam. Okay? Eve is called the mother of all living. Okay? All of us are from Adam and Eve. Okay? We're all children of Adam. We're all children of Eve. We're all children of Noah. You know, we can narrow it down there as well, you know. But that doesn't make you a child of God. It, you can only become a child of God, born again, when you believe on Jesus Christ, okay? Spiritually speaking, you can be born again, and you're born as a child of God. In order for us to go to heaven, we must be born spiritually. We must become a son of God. You know, there's also a reality, which is outside of the scope of the sermon, that there is another spiritual birth. Okay, where people can actually become children of the devil, you know, children of Belial, 
you know? And we think about, you know, when you're born of God, when you become a son of God, you know, we believe in once saved, always saved. It doesn't matter how, how you live your life, you will always be a son of God. We use that illustration, you know, when we go out soul winning. Especially when I take my kids. I like using that illustration because then I, I, you know, point to my son. Doesn't matter what my son does in his life, even if he hates me, even if he leaves home, he's still my son. That will never change. And unfortunately for those that become children of the devil, the same thing is, is, is true. Once damned, always damned. Okay, once they become a child of the devil, once they become a reprobate, they are always damned. Okay, that, can, that cannot be changed. You cannot be unborn once you've been born into a family. Once you become a son, you cannot, we can never become unborn from Adam because we always had that flesh. Okay, and then when we're born of God, we can never be unborn of God because we're born of the Spirit. And those reprobates that are born of the devil, that are children of the devil, they cannot be unborn. Okay, that's why they're reprobate. That's why they have eternal... Anyway, that's outside of the scope of the sermon. But, you know, that's, that's a uh, truth that we see in the Bible. Now, let's keep reading. <laughs> Sorry, guys, I got a bit sidetracked. Uh, verse number 12. Verse number 12. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, what did we see in Galatians 4? Who can call God Father but his son? Who can call God Father but those that have the spirit of Jesus Christ in them? This son calls him Father. Give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto, unto them his living. And not many. And by the way, what did we see in Galatians 4 again? When you become a son of God, you become an heir with Christ. Remember that? So this son, he's an heir. He has an inheritance and he asks his father for that inheritance. Okay? That he divided unto them his living. Verse 13. And not many days after, the younger son gathereth all together and took his journey into a far country and there wasted his substance with riotous living. This man takes his inheritance, he takes what he has and goes and lives a riotous life in a far country. He goes and lives a dirty life. All right? And if you want an idea of what that was in verse 30, it says that prostitutes, that harlots were involved in this. Wouldn't surprise me if gambling and smoking marijuana is included in, in his righteous living. All right? But it's definitely prostitutes that he was, he was mucking around with, you know, destroying his life, wasting his life. Now, one thing you need to understand here, guys, is that just because you're, 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 you're a believer, just because you're a son of God, does not mean you will automatically serve Him. God gives us free will to do what we want, okay? He gives us freedom to decide, you know, do I, do I live after God or do I go for the righteous living? Do I go searching for sin and the, and the prostitutes and the drugs and the gambling? Do I seek that or do I seek to serve God? And you know what? If you seek to live that righteous life, God will allow you. Okay, and God will allow you and he'll have to chastise you. He'll have to correct you and you're going to hurt yourself. You're going to hurt your, your life. You might even destroy your life entirely, you know, seeking that way. But God will allow you. If that's what you want to do, he will let you go live that life. Okay, that's what this son did. He took in his, his inheritance and wasted it. Now let me say this. The moment that you're saved, okay, till the day you go and be with Christ, whether that's in death or in the rapture, okay, God has given you all those days of your life, okay, on this earth to build your inheritance in heaven. You have all the days of your life to serve Him. You have all the days of your life to earn rewards in heaven. You can do that, or you can take all the days of your life and live the righteous life. It's up to you, okay? You can, you can do that. And we see the younger son, he decided to waste his life after prostitutes. In verse 14, And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in the land, and he began to be in want. So he spent all his inheritance. Now he's in need. There's a mighty famine. He's hungry. Verse 15, And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into the fields to, to feed swine, to swine are pigs. Okay? Now, if you know at this point in time, with the Jews, pigs were seen as an unclean animal. All right? So there he is, you know, representing his unclean life, that there he is amongst the pigs. There he is having to uh, feed pigs. He's serving the pigs, all right? He's serving the pigs. That's how bad he's gotten to in his point in his life. And then in verse 16, and he would fain have filled his belly with the husks 
that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. He was so hungry, he would just want to eat what the pigs were eating. All right? Verse 17. And when he came to himself, boy, and that needs to happen, you know, when, when, we, when, we, when we leave God, when we, when we leave His presence and we seek after sin, we seek after an ungodly life, when we backslide, there needs to come to a point where we come to ourselves, we come to our senses and go, what am I doing here? That's what happened to him, okay? And when he finally realized the state that he's in, that's when he was able to repent. And when he came to himself, verse 17, he said, how many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare and i perish with hunger i will arise and go to my father and will say unto him father i have sinned against heaven and before thee hey he, he this is a man that's not been found out in his sin this is a man that realizes man i'm a sinner and i'm going to go and confess this i'm just going to face the consequences and i'm going to go to god and to the father and say that i've sinned against him just put my hand up and recognize that I failed instead of making excuses. That's real repentance. Instead of blaming others, instead of making excuses, just own up to the fact when you've sinned and you've turned your back against God. That's repentance. Verse 19. And am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. Okay? So... And this is important, because what do we read in Galatians 4? I'll just read it again. Verse 7. Wherefore thou art no more a servant, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. This man thinks, I can go back and uh, I've, I've lost my chance to be a son. I'll just, I'll just be a servant. You know, I'll, I'll go like that so you can see his humility. He doesn't go thinking of himself, you know, highly exalted as one that just deserves because he's the son you know, just deserves it all. To, you know, no, he goes back with humility. I'll be a servant. I'll just go and serve. You know, I'll just eat that bread that's, that's, that, that the servants get, you know. And then verse number 20. And, uh, and he arose and came to his father. And I love the next bit. And when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him. Hey, when we're backslidden, when we've turned against God, he hasn't forgotten you. He's always looking out for you to come back. Says here the father saw him. Okay? He was looking out for his son. And then it says, um, Yeah, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. You know, if you think, Oh, God, I, I've sinned. I've, man, I haven't picked up my Bible in days. I've... I've been sinning, Lord. I haven't been trying to overcome these sins in my life. And I say, well, I don't know, I'm too embarrassed. The Bible says God has compassion. God wants you to return back to Him. He wants you to confess your sins to Him. He wants you to acknowledge your mistakes to Him. He'll come and run, fall and kiss you. Okay? He loves His children. Verse 21. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight. And am no more worthy to be called thy son. Verse 22. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe, and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand, and shoes on his feet, and bring hither the fatted calf, and kill it, and let, let us eat, and be merry. For this is my son, for this my son was dead, and is alive again. He was lost, and is found and they began to be merry. You know, the son comes, you know, I'll just be a servant. I'm not worthy to be called your son. The father says, no, you are my son. Uh, you know, let's rejoice that my son has come back. You know, he was dead out there in the world. He was dead out there in sin. He wasn't serving me here in my kingdom. And yet he goes, when his son is repentant, he gets the best robe, the, a ring on his hand, shoes on his feet, new clothes, you know, jewelry, you know, he gives him a welfare and kills the fatted calf and they rejoice and, and have a party. They begin to be merry. You know, we should be people. We can't be like the Pharisees, okay, that look down at the sinners that have come to Jesus. Okay, no, 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 no. When a sinner has repented, when a backslidden Christian has been reunited with the Lord, we need to rejoice over that. Okay, we can't be like 
yeah, but do we really know if he's repented? No, no, no. If they've shown the signs of repentance, if they've acknowledged their sin, then let's rejoice over that. Okay? If the angels in heaven can rejoice, then we should be rejoicing when sinners, when backslidden Christians come back to the Lord. Or in a case, if we ever have to kick someone out of the church over a, a grievous sin, and they repent and they come and apologize, hey, we need to put that behind us. We need to rejoice that this believer has been restored to the church. Okay? And, and forgive him. Don't mention it again. Put it behind us and rejoice and be merry. That's how we should be. Okay? Not like the Pharisees were at the beginning, looking down at sinners and publicans. Verse 25. And his elder son was in the field, and as he came and drew nigh to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said unto him, Thy brother is come, and thy father hath killed the fatted calf, because he hath received him safe and sound. He should rejoice as well. His own brother has come back home. But the flesh gets in the way sometimes. Verse 28. And he was angry and would not go in. Therefore came his father out and entreated him. And he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years do I serve thee. Neither transgressed I um, at any time thy commandment. And yet thou never gavest me a kid that I may, might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this thy son was come, which have devoured thy living with harlots, thou hast killed for him the fatted calf. So you can see this one is the Christian. When you have a restored believer come back to church or a backslidden Christian brought back to God, you know, he criticizes it. You know, he says, why are we rejoicing over that? Hey, look at me. I've been serving God this whole time. Why aren't people rejoicing about me? You know, where's my reward? Look, this guy has a lot of reward. You'll see soon, okay? It's just that he's let the flesh get in the way. He's gotten a bit blinded. He's gotten a bit envious of his brother. And in the celebration, really, he should just be rejoicing with that brother, okay? He should be rejoicing, thanking God that his brother has been brought back home. And I love what he says in verse 31, how the father uh, responds to this. And he said unto him, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. It was meet that we should make merry and be glad, for this thy brother was dead and is alive again, and was lost and is found. Hey, you have the choice, okay? You have the choice. Do I live the righteous life? Do I go and serve sin? Do I go and serve swine? Okay, do I, do I go and just live for myself? Do I take what God has given me that all the days of my life, all the talents and, 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 and blessings that God has given me, and do I waste that? Or you make the decision like the older son that stays back and works hard and serves the father, okay? And look, when that, when that righteous man is restored, we should rejoice, we should celebrate, we should be happy, okay? But don't become bitter, don't become envious, don't get jealous about that, all right? Because God says there... Right, what, did he, what did he say? Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. Hey, that one that stays faithful, that one that serves God, they may not see the rewards on the earth, but God says you've got the maximum reward. You get it all. All right? Yeah, the younger son, he gets the ring. Yeah, he gets the shoes and the robe. He gets the fatted calf. But the older son gets it all. Everything that was left... All the maximum rewards are given to the older son because he saved, stayed, uh, stayed uh, faithfully serving God. All right? So let's not look down on believers that, are, that have struggled and, and they're being restored. No. You know, rejoice with them, but also recognize, but yeah, you know what? I'm just going to keep serving God, you know, because I know what's to come in the future. I know that I can earn maximum rewards. It's up to you guys. What do you want to do with, with your life? What do you want to do with the rest of your life? You know, take the inheritance and waste it or, or keep serving God and getting the maximum rewards you can get. Okay, that's going to be the best part of it all. Okay, you don't, it's not just the fatted calf and the gold ring and the shoes and the robe. You get everything that God will want to give you, all the maximum reward you can get. Hey, it, it's worth serving God. Okay, 
Okay, you, you might look and, and say, well, look at that brother. He's wasting his life and now he's restored. Everyone's happy. Maybe I should be living like, no. Okay, otherwise you lose your reward. Okay, you lose your reward seeking after worldly things. So I hope you can see in these parables, first of all, that, you know, this is not about salvation, but it's about a, a son being restored to the father. Okay, and in all three parables, what, what, what went missing already belonged to the owner. Okay. And of course, we know that when you're not saved, God says, I never knew you. I don't even know where you're from. Okay? Be mindful as you read through these things, parables especially. You know, they are cryptic on purpose. But hold on to the doctrines you know that are right, that are sound, that are clearly taught through the whole Bible. And then let the parables help develop, help visualize, help illustrate those doctrines that we already know. All right? Serve the Lord all the days of your life. It's going to be worth it, guys. God wants to give you the maximum rewards. Let's pray.